Welcome everyone to this presentation on the fundamentals of inlet screen design for wastewater treatment. Presenting will be myself, Rob Grant and Darren Hollins. Both Darren and I have designed and studied numerous screening installations over the years from many different perspectives. Neither of us consider ourselves to be experts, uh, hence why we are providing an introductory presentation, but we do hope that many, if not all of you, will find what we have to say of interest and useful in your future screening projects. Darren will cover screening fundamentals and typical screen types, and I'm going to wade in at the end with a few do's and don'ts. Uh, do feel free to ask questions via, via the attendee questions uh, section at the bottom of your presentation there, and we'll uh, pick those up at the end. So enough from me, and over to Darren. Hi everybody, um, my name is Darren Hollins. I'm gonna run you through uh, the agenda for today. I'm going to very quickly uh, breeze through the wastewater treatment process in general, just to highlight the uh, position of inlet screens on a wastewater treatment works and their importance. I'm going to run through some specifications that are available to aid designers of inlet screen installations. I'm going to give you some general design principles to, to follow when designing an installation. And then, as Rob said, I'll run you through some types of inlet screen themselves. I'll then hand over to Rob and he'll cover the do's and don'ts, uh, run through some examples, and then we'll pick up the questions at the end. Okay, so here we have a typical wastewater treatment process. I'm only gonna cover this very quickly. Um, the bit that we're looking at is number three, which is labeled headworks or inlet works. Essentially, we have uh, an upstream catchment, which is domestic or industrial sewage that makes its way Sewer treatment works, uh, the first treatment stage of which is the inlet works. The key thing that you need to take from this is the inlet screens are the most important thing at the head of the works. Everything that they take out protects the downstream processes via efficiencies, maintenance, just damage to downstream processes. I can't stress enough how important getting your inlet screens right is for the wastewater treatment process. Okay, so moving on from the wastewater process, treatment process in general, we have what essentially is the makeup of screenings. Now, as you can see on the screen, there's a, a vast array of things that can end up at an inlet works, ranging from Coke cans, tennis balls, um, cotton buds, toilet rolls. The key things that we're interested in are water and the poo. That's what we want to put through our plants. Uh, everything else we want to take out and remove. Now, obviously, you can have oddball things arriving at an inlet works as well. Um, I've seen uh, items such as steel sheets of plates, pieces of timber, toy corgi cars, and even a dog. Uh, none of that we want, so we've got to take that out, and that should set the scene for how reliable and robust this equipment needs to be. By way of uh, a picture, because it always paints a thousand words, that is a screening's blockage that was removed from a pump. So that gives you an idea of what this stuff looks like when it arrives at the treatment works. Okay, so we move on to the specifications uh, uh, slash information to aid a designer. Uh, there's a number of uh, information repositories out there, the key of which is the Water Industry Mechanical and Electrical Engineering Specification, uh, otherwise known as WIMES. The WIMES relevant to this uh, area, inlet screens, is 5.03. Uh, what WIMES is, is a collaborative effort from the, all, all the water companies in the UK to produce a generic specification for inlet screens across the piece so that all of the companies are asking for the same things. Uh, what it means in practice is that you actually have a very comprehensive specification and data sheet system, which if used correctly, allows the user to very accurately specify the type of screen that they want. For example, the WIMES data sheet alone talks through items such as screen type, operating environment, catchment information, the mode of operation, hydraulic information, the materials grades that are used, cleaning mode, the bearing types, the bearing life, all of these things which if specified correctly will result in hopefully selecting the appropriate screen for the task. In addition to this you've got client specifications which will often give you some of the give the designer uh, some of the parameters that are required to fill in on the WIMES data sheet. Clients will always have a preference and some of those preferences can filter through. Uh, in addition to this, you've got the Thompson RPM reports which cover uh, screenings capture ratio for inlet screens. I'm not gonna talk about that now, I'm gonna to touch on it a bit later. 
uh, environmental permits, these are probably the most fundamental thing when you're selecting an inlet screen. The environmental permits set the legal requirements for a treatment works, what they can treat in terms of flow, where they discharge, what they're allowed to discharge, uh, and it always covers the inlet screens as well. Typically, it's six millimeters in two dimensions for an inlet screen, but this is variable and changes depending on a number of factors, such as the downstream water course, or sometimes the downstream process itself, which might require tighter screening to protect the process. Furthermore, we've got the uh, landfill regulations. I'll just read this quickly. Uh, the landfill regulations require that non-hazardous waste as defined within the European Waste Catalogue from the pre-treatment stages of sewage treatment shall themselves be pre-treated in order to retain classification as a waste stream product suitable for acceptance at a non-hazardous landfill. What that means in plain English is you've got to do something to the screenings that you remove in order to get rid of them to a non-hazardous landfill site. DEFRA has helped us out here and they've issued a bit of guidance on the matter. This takes the form of a three-point test, which essentially, if you can pass one of the three points, then you can discharge your screenings that are removed to a non-hazardous landfill. So these tests must be a physical, thermal, chemical, or biological process. You must change the characteristics of the waste, or in order to do any of the above, you must reduce its volume, reduce its hazardous nature, facilitate its handling, or enhance its recovery. Okay, so we move on to the first thing that we need to consider as a designer, and that is catchment designation and screening volume. So first, you need to know your catchments. What is your catchment population? Every catchment will have a population equivalent, but you need to be aware that some will be permanent residents and some will be seasonal. If you're in a holiday location, that uh, permanent and seasonal could be a very large difference um, in population equivalents which means a very different screen is loading or flow approaching your treatment works. You need to be aware of the catchment characteristics, so whether you've got a very shallow gradient of sewer, which is going to deposit solids, and then in times of high flow, rifle them all down to your treatment works. You need to be aware if you've got a lot of pumping stations in the catchment, how much of that flow that enters the works is pumped, because obviously when pumps are on off, you'll get different amounts of flow at the works. And you need to be aware of the type of sewer, so whether it's a combined sewer, or whether you're on a separate sewer system. Obviously, if it's combined, you've got screenings and water um, in very large volumes entering the treatment works. If it's a separate system, you're going to have the same number of screenings, but much less flow entering the treatment works. So you've actually got a very different makeup um, of flow to screenings ratio that's entering the treatment works. Finally, you've got catchment overflows. So in the catchment, there'll be a number of combined sewer overflows. And as uh, water companies have endeavoured to, to treat those overflows better to protect the water courses, there's now a level of screening provided at most combined sewer overflows. Typically, those screens work by retaining the screens in the oncoming flow. So again, you've got flow passing out of the sewer system into the water course, but you're retaining the screenings, which is changing the ratio of screenings to water that's going to arrive at your treatment work. So uh, a way of assessing this was developed by Thompson RPM. We mentioned him earlier. Um, and that is the Picking Factor Assessment Protocol. I'm not going to go into detail on it. You can all see the report there. You can all access that report. But essentially, uh, all of those factors that I've mentioned previously will be given a picking factor, and you multiply that factor by your base load of screenings in the catchment to derive the actual amount of screenings that are going to enter a treatment works. Okay, so we're on to general design principles now. It's first important to know that there are two main types of screen. There are subcategories, but they'll all fall under either coarse or fine screens. We define coarse screens as screenings which have an aperture of greater than 6 mm, and we divide, define fine screens as those with less than 6 mm in two dimensions. Generally speaking, if you install coarse screens, it's going to be more expensive. Obviously, you're paying for more plants, you're paying for a larger civil footprint, a larger civil construction. And you need to be aware that that increased cost brings increased maintenance and so on and so forth. When to consider core screens are when your catchment really is not very great for the fine screen. So if you have a large number of CSOs, and again, as I said already, you're passing forward a lot of screenings to the fine screens, you're going to blind them quite quickly. So you may need core screens to protect them. If you've got a large diameter sewer, 
which is obviously capable of passing large debris down it. Then again, as that hits a fine screen, that's going to damage it, it's going to damage the plates. So you would consider a core screen as protection for that plant. Moving on from there, we've got some more general design principles. The first of which is the approach velocity to the screen. Generally speaking, we try to work on a minimum flow velocity approaching the screen of 0.5 meters a second. The reason for this is to maintain the solids in the flow. What we don't want is solids depositing in the inlet channel prior to the screens, waiting to be picked up when the flow increases at a later time. Obviously, as with all design and engineering, there's a compromise to be had here. Flows to a treatment works will vary. You'll have dry weather flow, three dry weather flow, flow to full treatment, storm conditions, and attachment with pumping stations, they'll come on and off, and with that will bring increases or decreases in flow. So your velocity and the approach channel has to be optimized to give you that minimum across that, across that range of flow rates. Moving forward into the screens themselves, generally speaking, we work on a maximum velocity through the screen of one meter per second. This does vary from manufacturer to manufacturer and they will advise, but the reason that this is kept at this typical value is to prevent pinholing through the screen. And what this is, is that the velocity is so fast through the apertures of the screen that you can actually push through screenings. So although they've been taken out, they'll actually pass straight through and move on to the downstream process. Finally, we've got the downstream velocity. And again, we're back at 0.5 as a minimum. This is to maintain any grit in the flow. Obviously, the screens won't take out grit because it's finer than the six millimeters, but there are downstream processes that will do that. So we want to keep it in the flow and not have it drop out in the channel. We move on to the head loss. Uh, Rob's going to touch on this a bit later, so just very quickly, you need to assess the screen in both its clean and dirty head loss conditions. There's different ways of doing that, and manufacturers will have their own ways, as will clients. Always be aware that you need to consider both options. Moving on from there, we have bypass requirements. It's always good practice to have a bypass on your inlet screens because at some point they will blind or they will fail. That's not a possibility, it's a given. On your bypass, you need to make sure that you can pass full flow and ideally screen that, but to a much lesser degree. You are literally protecting the process downstream from bulk solids in this scenario. Maybe 50 mil bar screen or something similar, and this would be manual. Perforation size on the screens, as I've already said, is sometimes dictated by the environmental permit, but this can be made tighter by the process constraints downstream. For example, if you've got a membrane bioreactor and you need um, less solids in the flow, you may screen down to three millimeters in two dimensions rather than the six. Moving forward, we're on to screening capture ratios. So again, this was done by Thompson RPM. The water companies decided to get together via a collaborative project under Uqweer, uh, and they produced what's now called the National Screen Evaluation Facility, or the NSEF, at Chester Lee Street Sewage Works within Northall Brew Water. What this did was provide um, water companies with a standardized test that was done independently of the screening manufacturers to tell you exactly how much screenings any particular screen will remove from the flow. As you can see there, you measure the uh, ratio of screenings in three different locations, upstream, downstream, and what the screen removes. And from that, you can derive how much of the screenings are actually removed by an individual screen. Wash water requirements. Rob's got some great examples of this and when this goes wrong. So all I'm going to say is this for me is fundamental. It's the most important thing that an engineer needs to get right. A manufacturer will give you their minimum flow and pressure requirements. And it is vital that the engineer take this on board, ideally giving more than that minimum. The primary way of cleaning the screen is the wash water. And it's crucial that you get this right. We've now got the flow presentation to the screen. What we're trying to do here in any installation, which will typically consist of a minimum of two screens and a bypass, is divide the flow equally across those screens. The reason we want to do this is to give a uniform approach velocity and a uniform screening load into the screen. You don't want the flow to take a preferential pass and all the screenings to go around to one while well, you've got a second screen sitting there doing nothing. What's been found from physical hydraulic modeling is that an ideal divergence angle is less than six degrees. What I mean by that is the angle at which the channel diverges to go to the inlet screens. 
what you'll find is that it's better to compromise on your downstream convergence angle than it is on your upstream divergence angle. Although I would always recommend that you talk this through with a hydraulic engineer if this is going to be the case and you are tight on space. So we move on to the types of inlet screens and we start with core screens. We've got rotating bar interceptors. These are commonly known as RBIs. This is a series of rotating bars which form a grill across an opening in an inlet channel, for example. The bars rotate at a peripheral velocity, similar to the velocity of the flow, and they gently pass through screenings that would normally be acceptable to a fine screen, but prevent large objects such as lumps of timber and other such things from, from passing forward. One key thing to remember with uh, RBIs is that at some point there's going to be a load of stuff in front of this that's been taken out and you need to have a mechanism to remove that from the channel. Uh, that's always a bit of a sticking point in these installations. Similarly with uh, core screens, we've got bar screens. As we've already said, the bar, the bar spacing can vary. You can have sort of 10, 12, 20, 25, 50 mil, whatever it is that you ask for really. This, this can be a manual or an automatic screen as shown in the images there. And again, it's provided to prevent gross solids, large gross solids from damaging fine screens. Moving on to fine screens themselves, we've got probably the most common screen in the industry uh, known as the escalator screen. It's pretty self-explanatory. It escalates screenings up out of the flow over the top of the screen where they're pushed on to the next stage of cleaning the compaction. Um, these screens are, as I've said, the most common. They're a proven technology. They've been uh, through several iterations of innovation and upgrade to, to make them a very reliable and robust piece of kit. Similarly, with band screens, um, we have a very high screens capture ratio for these screens. Uh, they're a bit unique in terms of that they can actually have flow from the inside to the outside or from the outside to the inside. Again, they primarily rely on wash water and brushes for cleaning. Um, and one key thing to note is that if you get any gross solids inside that band on an in-to-out screen, it can sometimes be very tricky to remove and access. And that's something to bear in mind if you're selecting this type of screen. We have lifting tines on both escalators and band screens. And what these are, are little fingers, for want of a better term, or tines, as they're actually called, that poke out from the screen every, say, three, four, or fifth elements. And what they do is they actually lift gross solids from the flow and prevent what's known in the industry as rag rolling, where a large accumulation of rags in front of the screen are bound together and actually roll up into sort of like a rolled up carpet uh, and that actually can't be pulled out of the flow. So these times come round every so often and just pick at those screenings and pull them up and remove them from the flow. We've now got spiral sieve screens, which are primarily focused on smaller treatment works. Um, they have a, a big advantage in that they are a screenings, washing and compaction unit in one. Um, it's a very simple unit that relies on a shaftless screw to remove screenings and pull them up and compact them. Uh, again, it's proven technology. It's been around for a long time, but the capture ratio is a little bit lower than your escalator and band screens. We've next got drum screens. Uh, I've not actually designed any of these, but I'm aware that they work well in the industry. They're, they're commonplace. So again, it's a proven technology. They've got uh, traditionally good capture ratios in the range of 70 to 75%. And we move on to uh, the small screens again. This is as small as they get, really. We're down to uh, what's called a copa sack. Uh, they have a flow range of about 12 and a half liters a second. Key thing with these is that it's essentially a sack that collects screenings. There is no cleaning mechanism. Once that screening sack is full, someone needs to remove it and either carry it away or put it in a skip and dispose of it. And that should be considered when you put these screens in place. It's not very nice for someone to uh, pull one of these full wet and festering and put it in the back of their van for all that water to drain out and make everything all smelly and horrible. Finally, we've got package plant systems, which if you don't want to take all the advice that Rob and I offer today, um, kind of gets you out of jail free, where some suppliers have thought through some of the problems for you and actually built package installations. So you can see there in the picture on the right, there are two spiral sieve type screens, and in the center of those is a manually raked bar screen. So again, as we discussed earlier, you've got a duty and a standby screen. And then you've got a manual screen for a bypass. So flow will always go forward to that treatment works. 
and there is always some kind of protection offered. Okay, thanks, Darren. Uh, I'm going to cover some of the key do's and don'ts in uh, inlet screen installation systems design. Uh, apologies in advance if there's any repetition here of things that have gone previously, but suffice to say, if we do say things more than once, it's probably because they're a fairly important design consideration. So first and foremost, uh, assessing the incoming catchment, um, fairly obvious, uh, but your catchment can be flashy, i.e. more or less prone to the effects of sudden rainfall, or it might involve open culverts or other sources for what you might call non-domestic sewage. Uh, knowing your catchment will help you to determine if a core stream is a sensible investment and also help you to determine what your expected peak screenings loading might be. A uh, high peak loading can be accommodated hydraulically in greater free load in your inlet channels or perhaps by providing an assist screen or screens that operate when the last duty screen is overloaded. Uh, knowing your peak load obviously helps you to size the screenings handling plant uh, that comes downstream as well. Uh, ensuring upstream and downstream isolation, often achieved through penstocks or stop logs. Isolation of individual screens is almost always a sensible thing to provide, as it facilitates access for maintenance while maintaining a, a level of screening capability through your standby or your assist screen provision. That's, of course, on the presumption that you're designing in uh, more than one screen. Don't forget that you will almost always need downstream as well as upstream isolation, as screens are usually hydraulically linked. Uh, choose your isolation method to be operable under the highest differential head that the uh, that the isolation will see. Stop logs are a, a cheaper alternative to penstocks, but usually much less operator friendly. Uh, ensure wash water availability and quality and flow and pressure. Uh, one of the more common modes of failure of screens installation uh, is through the lack of availability of adequate wash water. The function of the wash water being to clean the screen panels of debris before each panel returns to the screen, to, returns to screen the sewage again. Lack of wash water results very rapidly in screenings carryover, screenings blinding and build up, uh, and your poor user will not thank you for the inevitable mess that ensues. Poorly operating screens facilities are pretty unpleasant places to be. Screening installations often require a brand new wash water facility, drawn usually from a final effluent source, but often from a portable source too. Consider providing duty and standby wash water facilities, be that pumps or tanks or perhaps entire systems, and consider carefully what monitoring of the facilities you will provide. Again, that could be pump tripped alarms or low pressure or low flow alarms. Uh, Optimise approach velocities. Your screen supply will help you here, but consider carefully how your incoming and outgoing to a lesser extent flow is presented to the screen. Firstly, Avoid dead spots in the channels, as these will result in solid deposition. Secondly, your approach velocity should typically, as we mentioned, be in the range of 0 0.4, 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 meters per second. Any lower, you get that solid deposition, and any higher, and you may end up forcing screenings through the screens, depending, of course, on the type of screen you are designing for. If you have a high flow range, and therefore a high velocity range, consider how you might use more than one screen, so a duty plus any number of assist screens, to accommodate this. Provide a bypass for the screen installation. Screen installations normally include one, two or more screens to treat the highest expected incoming flow. These might be arranged to include a standby or merely a, a last or final assist screen. In either case, it is always sensible, wherever practical, to provide 100% hydraulic safety to a sewage treatment installation. That way, at least if something, or perhaps everything, does fail, you know where the sewage is going to end up, and you can plan to contain it there. Again, unwanted overflows or other spillages at inlet works are usually pretty unpleasant and potentially harmful to health and to the environment. Bypasses can be in the form of a pipe or a channel, and the access point for the bypass is normally a weir or a bell mouth, again to avoid reliance on, say, a penstock or valve to open in times of need. Avoid the temptation to screen your bypass simply because you can, Unless, of course, you make that screen hydraulically safe or overtoppable, as screens do block and fail much more easily than open channels or nice big pipes. Uh, assess your screen head loss of both clean and blinded conditions. It's fairly obvious, but remember that at any given flow, the head loss across the screen, and therefore the level of water upstream of the screen, 
will vary depending on how much debris is already on the screen or how well blinded it is. Again, your screen manufacturer can help you here, uh, as your blinding factor depends not only on how much debris there is in the sewage, but also on the rate at which the screen is cleaned or removed from the floor. Uh, consider access to the screen. Uh, screen installations are notoriously difficult to provide access for. It does seem that no matter how hard you try, there's always a nut or an instrument or a greasing point that is out of reach. Think carefully about what the operator will need access to for regular and non-routine maintenance and provide suitable access equipment. That's usually stairways, walkways, hand railing, lighting, lifting gear uh, that is suitable for the task. Think about how the screen might fail. For example, lack of wash water, burnt out motor, worn cleaning brushes, block spray bars, bottom bearing failure, panel damage, debris buildup, etc. And what you would have to do to rectify the problem. That will help to give you a clear picture of what your overall design might need to look like. It's particularly important when undertaking a refurbishment uh, or asset renewal project, not to simply accept that previous designs have left a lot to be desired in respect of access, and instead make sensible, cost-effective provisions in the new design. Always check the environment in which the screen is installed. Uh, most sewage screens and installations are, are pretty similar in this regard, but do pay careful attention to any installations that are enclosed, as this can lead to corrosive atmospheres being created. Enclosure could mean the, the screens are in a building, or could mean that the inlet channels have been covered to prevent the release of odours. Where you have the potential for explosive gases to be present or to build up, you could potentially have a disease issue on your hands. This means that you must take action, uh, legally, in the right order, to prevent the risk of explosion, not to control the risk of explosion. In this case, that might mean forced or natural ventilation or providing non-sparking equipment in certain areas in and around the screens. So now a few key don'ts. Some of these are a bit of an inversion of the do's, so apologies for any duplication or repetition, but again, if it's worth stating twice, it's probably important. Um, don't pump directly onto a screen face. Again, a velocity or flow presentation thing. Uh, employ a stilling chamber or a baffling arrangement at the very least to avoid solid deposition and screen push through. Uh, don't utilize uh, screen water for cleaning. If you design the system correctly, you will get a plentiful supply, but you will run the very real risk of blocking the spray bar nozzles at least, and possibly the pumps themselves, due to the inevitable, if small, amounts of screens in the water at this point in the process. Uh, sprayed and thus aerated water can give rise to nasty aerosols and the further upstream in the process you do this, the higher the likelihood. Don't hamper access to the screens. Uh, a bit of a repeat, uh, but it's worth restating because it's so easy to do. Really think about, after the screen is installed, what the operator and the maintainer will have to do in reality. Remember to consider how the component bits themselves, so the screens, the laundry trough, the instruments, the spray bars, etc., will need to be physically removed and reinstalled uh, into their place of residence. Uh, finally, don't forget interfaces with existing equipment and don't forget skip and vehicular access. Screens installations can very quickly become very high, very high, wide, but not particularly handsome installations. For example, screening skips uh, take up a lot of room in themselves, but when you factor in getting a skip wagon in front of them, you end up needing miles more room than you might have first imagined. This last key don't is very important when considering the design requirements for a project that will include existing equipment, hard standing areas, spatial restrictions, hydraulic restrictions, but it does all need factoring in. And it's strongly recommended that any decisions not to provide access to or interfaces with this or that are documented and agreed with your client or your user. So just a few photos to demonstrate a few of the points made. Uh, this installation here is just four weeks old, i.e. four weeks ago it was brand spanking new. Uh, that's before this picture was taken. Uh, this mess is all down to a poorly operating wash water supply and I certainly for one wouldn't fancy cleaning that up. Uh, this is the inside of a band screen. So the screen is just going round and around and around and never to be removed from the process floor. Poor distribution. Uh, so this is the same installation as the previous photo. Here, poor flow presentation has resulted in solids deposition down the left of the channel there. 
Uh, and again, some poor soul is going to have to get in and dig that out, probably manually in the fullness of time. Uh, seriously, though, stagnant, stagnant sewage can cause septicity and pockets of explosive gases to form, so it's uh, best avoided. Uh, high approach velocities. As you can see in this picture on the left there, the, uh, the flow is roaring towards the screen. And one of the main issues with this is that it creates the potential for screenings to be forced through the screen and into the downstream processes. That lump of stuff in the uh, right hand picture there was taken out after the screen, believe it or not, and not upstream. Poor material selection. Uh, you can see here this is an enclosed screening installation which uh, happens to be in a coastal environment. So we've got high chlorides in the atmosphere and limited ventilation and, and this has resulted in fairly extensive corrosion of the screen and motor as you can see. No access to the bottom bearings. These screens here appear to disappear under the decking at the front of the screen. So I for one not sure how uh, you're expected to get that screen out if the, if the bottom bearing fails. Uh, the picture on the right here is in particular is again a demonstration of how installing your pen stocks too close to your screen can hamper access. The picture on the left there is not necessarily a bad design, but does demonstrate um, how quickly you can get very limited access between the screen's discharge point at the top back end of the screen and the launder trough beneath. Again, a couple of pictures of installations that aren't necessarily uh, bad. Uh, which do show how you might uh, need much more space to integrate everything, including your screening, handling plant and your skips, than you might expect. Fairly, uh, fairly wide pictures there. And just finally, a couple of fairly old-looking inlet works here with uh, limited circulation room around the screens themselves and pretty much no access provision for getting to the motors uh, in particular, should you need to. And that's it. That's all Darren and I have to say for now. Uh, we hope you found it informative. And if you do have any questions, then please feel free to, to share them now and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you. OK, uh, well, I hope you found that uh, informative, uh, useful. Uh, we have had uh, a few questions coming through Darren. Uh, just have a look at these now. Okay, uh, your friend's asked uh, how the screens function in cold temperatures. Um, I'll pick that one up. Um, yeah, they, they can suffer in, in cold temperatures. It depends how cold, of course. Uh, screening installations can be exposed. They tend to be at the at the top geographically of the uh, of the works. Uh, cold drafts, etc. Uh, they do tend to function okay. It, it tends to be the wash water system that suffers more than the screens themselves. So a liberal dose of uh, trace heating and lagging on that uh, can help. Uh, make sure the spray bars are running. You can set your control philosophy to make sure the screens and the wash water is uh, run constant in particularly cold temperatures. But uh, in order to optimize it, you really need to be a heat transfer expert. So if you, if you think you're gonna be susceptible to frost, then some, some sensible measures is, uh, is all you really need. Okay, uh, picking up another question here, we've got um, what are the key advances and innovations uh, that you've seen in the design of inlet screens? It's it's a good question, this. it's um, Inlet screens have been around for a long time now, many years in fact, and their designs are pretty much tried and tested, as we said in the presentation. Um, what this means in reality is that any innovation has been evolution rather than revolution. Uh, a key advancement that I've seen in particular in recent years has been the introduction of self-adjusting brushes. Previously on escalator type screens, the brushes used to clean, used to clean the face of the screen would wear over time and eventually uh, would require manual intervention to ensure that the brush actually stayed in contact with the screen face. Um, if it didn't receive that manual intervention, then you'd end up with the, the brush not being in contact with the screen, and obviously you'd have a blinded screen continually rotating, and essentially um, lowering the performance of the screen and potentially leading to an overflow situation. The self-adjusting brushes are spring-loaded and as such apply a permanent uniform pressure onto the uh, brush and therefore onto the screen face itself cleaning the screen face without the need for that manual intervention. So I, I would say that that's one, been one of the, um, the good refinements that we've seen in, in the recent times. 
Uh, just looking through these, you've got, uh, oh, this is a good one. Um, cost benefit analysis. How would you approach a cost benefit analysis uh, for a, a screen? It says here. That's, that. that's from Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, cost benefit. Consider the cost. How much is it going to cost to install your screen or screens? What are the benefits? That the benefits are, well, it, numerous and, and extensive, as, as we've tried to get across in this uh, in, throughout the course of the webinar. Consider the impact of having all your screenings going through to your downstream process. How reliable is that process likely to be? Um, not very, uh, in, in our experience. Uh, you can end up with consent failures at the very worst, um, extensive and regular maintenance at the very least. It's, it's very rare to see um, not le less than 100% of the flow that would arrive at the, the screening installation being screened um, by design. Uh, and that sort of almost answers the question for you that the cost benefit analysis is is so uh, outweighed in favor of screening everything essentially that you almost always do it. Uh, I think we've got a couple more coming through. Okay, um, this one is how should you operate your inlet screen? Um, so I assume that's referring to the sort of operating philosophies that you could use. Um, and this is, this is a tricky question to answer really. Um, it's going to operating philosophies of screens are going to differ from end user to end user, from water company to water company. Um, but it's vital that the designer understand how these screens are going to be operated before he undertakes his design. Uh, I'll break it down into chunks, I think, and try and answer that. So, in simple terms, screens tend to operate on level control, utilizing an upstream and a downstream level device, such as an ultrasonic or similar. Um, the way that that works is that as the screen blinds, the level upstream of the screen increases. Once this reaches a level set point, the screen rotates to move the blinded panels out of the flow and present the flow with some nice new clean panels. Uh, the level upstream obviously drops and the cycle repeats. Um, you could also have a second higher level set point that could trigger the screen to fully rotate in order to continuously clean the screen face. Uh, and the reason this is done is that obviously the, the screenings are coming in so thick and fast that the screen can't keep up. So it, it jumps from the, the step rotation to a full, fully automatic rotating scenario. Um, you can even further take that a step further by having a two speed motor and uh, actually having a second higher speed again at another level set point that rotates the screen at a second speed to increase the cleaning potential. Um, moving on from the, the individual screen control themselves, you need to think carefully about um, what's happening to your um, standby screen whilst your duty screen's in operation. Essentially what I mean is, have you designed your channel velocities to be optimum with one screen running or two? If they're optimised with one screen running, what's happening in the standby channel whilst that screen's running? Is that sitting stagnant? Is it collecting screenings? Is it settling out? Is the penstock open or closed? Where's that penstock located? Is it uh, close enough at the channel that you can have it shut and you only open it when that standby change is over? Or is it left open all the time? This changes vastly from works to works and from company to company, but it's a really simple thing to get wrong and can lead to, when you do rotate to your standby screen, an absolute humongous flush of screenings coming through to that standby screen and blinding it very quickly. So it's something that really needs thinking about. Uh, I don't think there's an answer as to what the perfect operating scenario is. Like I say, it's subject to opinion, but I think hopefully that gives you something to think about uh, when you're selecting how your screens are going to operate. I've got a question here, Darren, that says, how do you design a screen for maximum first flush of screenings from the sewerage network? That may occur after heavy rainfall following periods of dry weather. That's a very good question. It's a, it, it would require a very detailed uh, answer, probably a webinar in itself. But uh, in terms of uh, a few principles, and feel free to jump in and help me out here, Darren. Um, partly through experience, which is a bit of a cop-out, um, but if, if you're providing a, a replacement screen or, or an adjustment to an existing screening installation, you would speak to the operators of the, the existing installation and, and determine what they feel is the, the, the peak loading that, that can arrive at the screen at any one time. You'll often get better information than any design or designer could ever provide from uh, first-hand experience of, of the operator. But yeah, if, if you've got a, a catchment that, that's flat or steep, you'll get a different peaking factor, i.e. The, the amount of screens that you get over and above typical levels of screening. 
You can design in uh, a number of screens due to assist standby to, to cope with that. You can set the screens to run uh, more frequently. The, the key here is uh, having a, a, the best estimate possible by whatever means of how much you're going to get at the screen. And then uh, it, it comes down to liaison with the screen manufacturer then as to how quickly they think they can operate the screen and get rid of the screen. And, and obviously there's a, there's a knock-on effect uh, downstream the screens into the, the screens handling plant that needs to be considered. So yeah, it's not easy, but it's all about determining by experience or by experimentation what the, what the ratio of peak screenings to typical screenings is. Uh, just to add to that then, Rob, I'd, I'd probably link that in with the previous question and say, obviously, if you've got a particularly flashy catchment and you do think you've got a big first flush coming in, um, then you can look to amend your operating philosophy accordingly, whether it be by introducing the um, two-speed motor option or whether it be by flicking your standby screen into an assist mode and periods of you know, um, first flush. So if, if you suddenly get a, a rapid change in level, then it brings both screens in rather than just one. There isn't really a right or wrong answer. It's just different ways of, of sort of skinning the cat. But yeah. you, you've got to just take the best information you can, as Rob said, and then try and make any adjustments you can in your design to try and accommodate it. But unfortunately, there isn't a, a one-shot answer to that question. No. Uh, I've got a question here. What type of screen is suitable for very deep 30-plus metres wastewater pumping stations? I, I suspect that's come from a... A typical project that this uh, this person is uh, is working on, or a, or a current project perhaps. Um, the, the answer is it's it's the same answer whether you're, you're 30 meters below ground or 30 meters above ground. Essentially, although there are obviously other considerations to make in in respect of if if you are in a deep shaft, you're going to have less ventilation than if you're in the open air. You might need to consider materials, but the uh, the type of screen will will be the same. It's dependent on. Um, uh, client preference, uh, the nature of the screen is coming to the screen, the rate at which you need to clean it. Um, but it's, it's all the, the usual things. And obviously, as I say, you've got um, environmental con constraints and considerations to make and also access constraints and considerations to make. So one particular screen manufacturer perhaps might have a screen that is uh, easier to remove or, or, um, or install. Um, but that's that's the, a very sort of vague consideration that you'd need to make. So the answer is exactly the same as if you were above ground, but with obviously considering the, the environment in which you're working. Okay, um, we've got another question here. What are the typical nuisance activities for inlet screens? Uh, sorry, maintenance activities. My eyesight is failing me uh, for inlet screens. Um, okay, so. Like I uh, stated earlier, you've got things like uh, brushes on screens that need adjusting. That's not just escalators, uh, which some of which have the uh, self-adjusting brushes, but there's brushes on spiral screens um, and similar. And obviously those are wear, uh, wear and tear items, so they need replacing periodically. You also have a number of bearings, typically the bottom bearings are the, the more difficult ones to access that need greasing. You can get sealed for life bearings, but... Um, Realistically, sooner or later they'll need replacing or, or filling back up with grease anyway. Um, and then you've got things like checking the motor oil and, and things like that. Um, so generally speaking, there isn't a ton of maintenance to go on to in the screens, but they are something that needs uh, a lot of TLC. They can fall over very quickly because of the nature of what the, the job that they have to perform. So obviously, um, although not maintenance heavy they do need a lot of checking and a lot of tweaking really of those items just to make sure that everything's running at its optimum you need to keep a constant check on the wash water and make sure that's functioning because that provides the primary uh, cleaning mechanism for the screen and typically is, is a source of uh, continual problems whether it be from uh, frozen pipes or blocked nozzles or similar but that that needs to be uh, checked regularly as well to make sure that the screen functions properly Okay, I think we've got uh, just one more at the moment, and that's um, that's from Billy, and, and he's asked. He, he said he's seen inlet channel steps um, in front of the screens. Um, what are these for? Uh, yeah, another good question. Uh, often in uh, in screens installation, you will see a step down um, in front of the uh, the screen installation. Uh, these are generally uh, provided to aid flow presentation to the screens and often provided as a, as a requirement 
um, of the, the manufacturer. Some screens manufacturers insist upon it, some advise it, and it's all about preventing uh, getting a load of rubbish in, in front of your screen that, again, somebody's going to have to clean out. These, these things do tend to self-correct, uh, and the screen's deposition is, is only a problem in, insofar as you've got to remove it at some stage um, before it goes septic or causes you other problems and access issues. So yeah, it's, it's all about floor presentation is that, and sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. Generally, it's better practice, but not essential, I would say. And I think that's about it. Yeah, there's no more questions on the board, so um, I guess all there is left is for me and Rob to thank you for uh, for listening to us. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you found some of it useful. Uh, and feel free to contact us via the IMEC key, um, via the contact details that you saw in the presentation, if you need to. One final thing to mention, uh, other than thanks for the questions, they were all very good, um, is that the um, there will be an on-demand version of this webinar. It is being recorded and that will be available via the uh, IMEC website in due course. But for now, uh, thank you for joining in.